This is the fourth part of the program on viruses and viral infection. In this part of the program, I'll deal with the mechanisms by which viruses cause disease. The critical elements of viral infection that I will discuss here include the modes of transmission of viruses between hosts, the spread of viruses within the host once they begin an infection, and the various modes of infection that viruses can induce. Viruses can spread from one host to the other by a number of different routes, as shown on this slide. Several are transmitted by ingestion, such as the viral enteritis or hepatitis viruses. Some can be spread by respiratory droplets or even aerosols. Chickenpox is an example of the latter case. Some by contact with the skin or penetration through the skin, such as by animal bites or even by direct contact. Several of the viruses are transmitted uh, sexually and some parenterally, either by the blood-borne route or by arthropods. For most viral infections, when they infect a new host, they begin to replicate locally where they have been inoculated. In some cases, the virus may initiate an infection at a secondary site if, if it is equipped to spread to other cells or even to a tertiary site. I'll give examples of each of these. As an example of a virus that replicates locally, I have chosen rotavirus. This is an enteric virus that uh, infects the epithelial cells of the GI tract only, but doesn't really spread outside of the GI tract. So here we have a virus that is replicating at the site that it's inoculated, but does not spread in the host. Well, polio virus is also a virus that is inoculated through the gastrointestinal route and it does infect epithelial cells. The virus may be shed into the stools even before symptoms occur. However, with poliovirus, there is a viremia that occurs from the intestine, and the virus is tropic for neurons in the uh, spinal column and the brain, and uh, may cause paralytic polio in some cases of poliovirus infection. However, a virus that does have three levels of spread is rabies. Rabies enters the host by a bite from an infected mammal, and it replicates at the bite site. After that causes no symptoms, but the virus will then enter neurons and spread into the central nervous system. Ultimately, the virus can ascend to the brain and cause rabies encephalitis. However, that's not the end of the story, because the virus has to be transmitted to another host, so it will spread to other organs, including the salivary glands, so that the infected individual before it dies will spread the virus to another host by biting. The spread of a virus within an individual host is what we refer to as viral tropism. This means that the virus has a predilection to infect certain cells when it finds them. Tropism is determined by the species, since some viruses can infect uh, some species quite efficiently, but not others at all. It may be influenced by cellular receptors, such as the case of HIV, in which only CD4 lymphocytes are infected by the virus efficiently. Or it could be affected by the intracellular environment, meaning that the virus requires certain machinery and certain types of cells in order to replicate, and that machinery may not be found in other types of cells. Viral infections may damage the host in a variety of ways. The most obvious way would be to produce cellular damage in the cells that are directly infected by the virus, and in some cases, this is the source of damage during a viral infection. On the other hand, sometimes viral infections will cause uncontrolled growth when the replication of the virus is linked to the replication of the cell. This can result in proliferative lesions uh, that can look like tumors or even benign lesions such as warts. Alternatively, some viruses will induce a, a cell-mediated immune response, which uh, may be the cause of cell cellular damage indirectly. So basically, a viral infection can produce a hypersensitivity response that creates a disease in the same way that bacterial, parasitic, and fungal infections may. Viruses will typically cause one of three types of infection. An acute infection is one in which the manifestations of the disease associated with the virus occurs acutely 
and then resolves as the virus is eliminated from the host. The key element here is elimination, that is, uh, an immune response uh, is triggered that causes the virus to be eliminated from the host completely and the disease disappears and does not recur. In contrast to an acute infection, chronic infections uh, consist of viral infections that are not uh, adequately cleared from the host and thus a continuation of damage due to the virus infection may persist over a very long period of time, sometimes indefinitely. And finally we have the case of latent infections in which viruses may disappear or eclipse themselves inside of an infected cell and not replicate their uh, virions for a long period of time. During that period of time the virus is said to be in latency. It will be uh, expressing some viral proteins that maintain this state of latency but it is not replicating the host proteins and the genome that's required to make new virions. So the virus cannot really be detected by ordinary culture or uh, serologic means at this point. However, the virus may remain in this latent state for months to years and not reemerge until some trigger has uh, developed that causes it to go into an active replicating state. At that point, the virus may uh, cause manifestations of the original disease or some modified course uh, of uh, infection and disease. Um, based on the fact that it is now recurrent and the host has some level of immunity. So here are some examples of uh, viral infections that uh, fall into these three main categories. Influenza is an example of an acute infection. It causes mild to severe symptoms during the acute phase, but then it is cleared from the body and the virus is eliminated. In contrast, HIV, the hepatitis viruses, and many others may cause chronic infections where the virus will persist in a subset of cells over a very long period of time, continually producing some damage to the host. And then as an example of latent infection, we have chickenpox with recurrent zoster. Chickenpox is an infection that's known to occur in childhood, but some of the virus may remain latent in sensory ganglion cells in the spinal column and emerge years later uh, as an eruption of herpes zoster. For any given viral infection, the outcome may be determined by a number of different factors. Uh, the initial inoculum is one. Uh, obviously, the more virus that's inoculated at the outset, the more severe the infection is likely to be. The site of inoculation also may influence the course of infection. This is uh, typical in herpes simplex infections where a type 1 or type 2 virus um, may cause slightly different manifestations whether they're inoculated in the oral labial region or in the genital region. The host age and immune status is obviously going to influence how well the host can mount an immune response to a chronic virus. So uh, that may influence the outcome of infection as well. And there are many genetic factors, some of which we know and many of which we don't know, that influence whether an individual may be susceptible to infection and, if susceptible, how they will respond. We know, for example, that an absence of the CCR5 receptor on the surface of cells makes uh, HIV an unlikely infectious agent in persons who carry that mutation. Similarly, uh, herpes simplex encephalitis is likely to occur only in a certain genetic background and is likely not to occur if an individual does not have that background. So there are clearly some genetic determinant factors that uh, influence whether a person can become infected and if they do, what course they have.